Chapter 11 of Little Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Crow Girl. Little Men by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter 11 Uncle Teddy. For a week, Dan only moved from bed to sofa. A long week and a hard one, for the hurt foot was very painful at times. The quiet days were very wearisome to the active lad, longing to be out enjoying the summer weather, and especially difficult was it to be patient. But Dan did his best, and every one helped him in their various ways. So the time passed, and he was rewarded at last by hearing the doctor say on Saturday morning, "'This foot is doing better than I expected. Give the lad the crutch this afternoon, and let him stump about the house a little.' Hooray! shouted Nat, and raced away to tell the other boys the good news. Everybody was very glad, and after dinner the whole flock assembled to behold Dan crutch himself up and down the hall a few times before he settled in the porch to hold a sort of levee. He was much pleased at the interest and good will shown him, and brightened up more and more every minute for the boys came to pay their respects the little girls fussed about him with stools and cushions and teddy watched over him as if he was a frail creature unable to do anything for himself they were still sitting and standing about the steps when a carriage stopped at the gate a hat was waved from it and with a shout of uncle teddy uncle teddy rob scampered down the avenue as fast as his short legs would carry him all the boys but Dan ran after him to see who should be first to open the gate, and in a moment the carriage drove up with boys swarming all over it, while Uncle Teddy sat laughing in the midst with his little daughter on his knee. "'Stop the triumphal car and let Jupiter descend,' he said, and jumping out, ran up the steps to meet Mrs. Bear, who stood smiling and clapping her hands like a girl. "'How goes it, Teddy?' "'All right, Joe.' Then they shook hands, and Mr. Lorry put Bess into her aunt's arms, saying as the child hugged her tight, Goldilocks wanted to see you so much that I ran away with her, for I was quite pining for a sight of you myself. We want to play with your boys for an hour or so, and see how the old woman who lived in a shoe and had so many children she did not know what to do is getting on. I'm so glad. Play away and don't get into mischief, answered Mrs. Joe, as the lads crowded round the pretty child admiring her long golden hair dainty dress and lofty ways for the little princess as they called her allowed no one to kiss her but sat smiling down upon them and graciously patting their heads with her little white hands they all adored her especially rob who considered her a sort of doll and dared not touch her lest she should break but worshipped her at a respectful distance made happy by an occasional mark of favour from her little highness as she immediately demanded to see Daisy's kitchen, she was borne off by Mrs. Joe, with a train of small boys following. The others, all but Nat and Demi, ran away to the menagerie and gardens to have all in order, for Mr. Lorry always took a general survey and looked disappointed if things were not flourishing. Standing on the steps, he turned to Dan, saying like an old acquaintance, though he had only seen him once or twice before, "'How's the foot?' "'Better, sir. Rather tired of the house, aren't you?' guess i am and dan's eyes roved away to the green hills and woods where he longed to be suppose we take a little turn before the others come back that big easy carriage will be quite safe and comfortable and a breath of fresh air will do you good get a cushion and a shawl demi and let's carry dan off the boys thought it a capital joke and dan looked delighted but asked with an unexpected burst of virtue will mrs bear like it oh yes we settled all that a minute ago you didn't say anything about it, so I don't see how you could, said Demi inquisitively. We have a way of sending messages to one another without any words. It's a great improvement on the telegraph. I know its eyes. I saw you lift your eyebrows and nod toward the carriage, and Mrs. Bear laughed and nodded back again, cried Nat, who was quite at his ease with kind Mr. Lorry by this time. Right, now then, come on and in a minute dan found himself settled in the carriage his foot on a cushion on the seat opposite nicely covered with a shawl which fell down from the upper regions in a most mysterious manner just when they wanted it demi climbed up to the box beside peter the black coachman nat sat next dan in the place of honour while uncle teddy would sit opposite to take care of the foot he said but really that he might study the faces before him 
both so happy yet so different for dan's was square and brown and strong while nat's was long and fair and rather weak but very amiable with its mild eyes and good forehead by the way i've got a book somewhere here that you may like to see said the oldest boy of the party diving under the seat and producing a book which made dan exclaim oh by george isn't that a stunner as he turned the leaves and saw fine plates of butterflies and birds and every sort of interesting insect coloured like life he was so charmed that he forgot his thanks but mr lorry did not mind and was quite satisfied to see the boy's eager delight and to hear his exclamations over certain old friends as he came to them nat leaned on his shoulder to look and demi turned his back to the horses and let his feet dangle inside the carriage so that he might join in the conversation when they got among the beetles mr lorry took a curious little object out of his vest pocket and laying it in the palm of his hand said there's a beetle that is thousands of years old and then while the lads examined the queer stone bug that looked so old and grey he told them how it came out of the wrappings of a mummy after lying for ages in a famous tomb finding them interested he went on to tell about the egyptians and the strange and splendid ruins they have left behind them on the nile and how he sailed up the mighty river with the handsome dark men to work his boat how he shot alligators saw wonderful beasts and birds and afterwards crossed the desert on a camel who pitched him about like a ship in a storm uncle teddy tells stories most as well as grandpa said demi approvingly when the tale was done and the boy's eyes asked for more thank you said mr lorry quite soberly for he considered demi's praise worth having for children are good critics in such cases and to suit them is an accomplishment that any one may be proud of here's another trifle or two that i tucked into my pocket as i was turning over my traps to see if i had anything that would amuse dan and uncle teddy produced a fine arrow-head and a string of wampum oh tell about the indians cried demi who was fond of playing wigwam dan knows lots about them added nat more than i do i dare say tell us something and mr lorry looked as interested as the other two mr hyde told me he's been among em and can talk their talk and likes em began dan flattered by their attention but rather embarrassed by having a grown-up listener what is wampum for asked curious demi from his perch the others asked questions likewise and before he knew it dan was reeling off all mr hyde had told him as they sailed down the river a few weeks before mr lorry listened well but found the boy more interesting than the indians for mrs joe had told him about dan and he rather took a fancy to the wild lad who ran away as he himself had often longed to do and who was slowly getting tamed by pain and patience i've been thinking that it would be a good plan for you fellows to have a museum of your own a place in which to collect all the curious and interesting things that you find and make and have given you mrs joe is too kind to complain but it is rather hard for her to have the house littered up with all sorts of rattle-traps half a pint of door-bugs in one of her best vases for instance a couple of dead bats nailed up in the back entry wasps nests tumbling down on people's heads and stones lying round everywhere enough to pave the avenue there are not many women who would stand that sort of thing are there now as mr lorry spoke with a merry look in his eyes the boys laughed and nudged one another for it was evident that some one told tales out of school else how could he know of the existence of these inconvenient treasures where can we put them then said demi crossing his legs and leaning down to argue the question in the old carriage house but it leaks and there isn't any window nor any place to put things and it's all dust and cobwebs began nat wait till gibbs and i have touched it up a bit and then see how you like it he is to come over on monday to get it ready then next saturday i shall come out and we will fix it up and make the beginning at least of a fine little museum every one can bring his things and have a place for them and dan is to be the head man because he knows most about such matters and it will be quiet pleasant work for him now that he can't knock about much won't that be jolly cried nat while dan smiled all over his face and had not a word to say but hugged his book and looked at mr lorry as if he thought him one of the greatest public benefactors that ever blessed the world shall i go round again sir asked peter as they came to the gate after two slow turns about the half-mile triangle no we must be prudent else we can't come again i must go over the premises take a look at the carriage-house and have a little talk with mrs joe before i go 
and having deposited dan on his sofa to rest and enjoy his book uncle teddy went off to have a frolic with the lads who were raging about the place in search of him leaving the little girls to mess upstairs mrs bear sat down by dan and listened to his eager account of the drive till the flock returned dusty warm and much excited about the new museum which every one considered the most brilliant idea of the age i always wanted to endow some sort of an institution and i am going to begin with this said mr lorry sitting down on a stool at mrs joe's feet you have endowed one already what do you call this and mrs joe pointed to the happy-faced lads who had camped upon the floor about him i call it a very promising bear garden and i'm proud to be a member of it did you know i was the head boy in this school he asked turning to dan and changing the subject skilfully for he hated to be thanked for the generous things he did i thought franz was answered dan wondering what the man meant oh dear no i'm the first boy mrs joe ever had to take care of and i was such a bad one that she isn't done with me yet though she has been working at me for years and years how old she must be said nat innocently she began early you see poor thing she was only fifteen when she took me and i led her such a life it's a wonder she isn't wrinkled and grey and quite worn out and mr lorry looked up at her laughing don't teddy i won't have you abuse yourself so and mrs joe stroked the curly black head at her knee as affectionately as ever for in spite of everything teddy was her boy still if it hadn't been for you there never would have been a plum field it was my success with you sir that gave me courage to try my pet plan so the boys may thank you for it and name the new institution the lawrence museum in honor of its founder won't we boys she added looking very like the lively joe of old times we will we will shouted the boys throwing up their hats for though they had taken them off on entering the house according to rule they had been in too much of a hurry to hang them up i'm as hungry as a bear can't i have a cookie asked mr lorry when the shout subsided and he had expressed his thanks by a splendid bow trot out and ask asia for the gingerbread box demi it isn't an order to eat between meals but on this joyful occasion we won't mind and have a cookie all round said mrs joe and when the box came she dealt them out with a liberal hand every one munching away in a social circle suddenly in the midst of a bite mr lorry cried out bless my heart i forgot grandma's bundle and running out to the carriage returned with an interesting white parcel which being opened disclosed a choice collection of beasts birds and pretty things cut out of crisp sugary cake and baked a lovely brown there's one for each and a letter to tell which is whose grandma and hannah made them and i tremble to think what would have happened to me if i had forgotten to leave them then amid much laughing and fun the cakes were distributed a fish for dan a fiddle for nat a book for demi a money for tommy a flower for daisy a hoop for nan who had driven twice round the triangle without stopping a star for emile who put on airs because he studied astronomy and best of all an omnibus for franz whose great delight was to drive the family bus stuffy got a fat pig and the little folks had birds and cats and rabbits with black currant eyes now i must go where is my goldilocks mamma will come flying out to get her if i'm not back early said uncle teddy when the last crumb had vanished which it speedily did you may be sure the young ladies had gone into the garden and while they waited till franz looked them up joe and laurie stood at the door talking together how does little giddy gaddy come on he asked for nan's pranks amused him very much and he was never tired of teasing joe about her nicely she is getting quite mannerly and begins to see the error of her wild ways don't the boys encourage her in them yes but i keep talking and lately she has improved much you saw how prettily she shook hands with you and how gentle she was with bess daisy's example has its effect upon her and i'm quite sure that a few months will work wonders here mrs joe's remarks were cut short by the appearance of nan tearing round the corner at a breakneck pace driving a meddlesome team of four boys and followed by daisy trundling bess in a wheelbarrow hat off hair flying whip cracking and barrow bumping up they came in a cloud of dust looking as wild a set of little hoydens as one would wish to see so these are the model children are they it's lucky i didn't bring mrs curtis out to see your school for the cultivation of morals and manners she would never have recovered from the shock of this spectacle said mr lorry laughing at mrs joe's premature rejoicing over nan's improvement
laugh away i'll succeed yet as you used to say at college quoting some professor though the experiment has failed the principle remains the same said mrs bear joining in the merriment i am afraid nan's example is taking effect upon daisy instead of the other way look at my little princess she has utterly forgotten her dignity and is screaming like the rest young ladies what does this mean and Mr. Lorry rescued his small daughter from impending destruction, for the four horses were champing their bits and curvetting madly all about her as she sat brandishing a great whip in both hands. "'We're having a race, and I beat!' shouted Nan. "'I could have run faster, only I was afraid of spilling Bess,' screamed Daisy. "'Hi! Go long!' cried the princess, giving such a flourish with her whip that the horses ran away and were seen no more." my precious child come away from this ill-mannered crew before you are quite spoiled good-bye joe next time i come i shall expect to find the boys making patchwork it wouldn't hurt them a bit i don't give in mind you for my experiments always fail a few times before they succeed love to amy and my blessed marmee called mrs joe as the carriage drove away and the last mr lorry saw of her she was consoling daisy for her failure by a ride in the wheelbarrow and looking as if she liked it Great was the excitement all the week about the repairs in the carriage house, which went briskly on in spite of the incessant questions, advice, and meddling of the boys. Old Gibbs was nearly driven wild with it all, but managed to do his work nevertheless, and by Friday night the place was all in order, roof mended, shelves up, walls whitewashed, a great window cut at the back, which let in a flood of sunshine, and gave them a fine view of the brook, the meadows, and the distant hills, and over the great door, painted in red letters, was the Lawrence Museum. All Saturday morning the boys were planning how it should be furnished with their spoils, and when Mr. Lorry arrived, bringing an aquarium which Mrs. Amy said she was tired of, their rapture was great. The afternoon was spent in arranging things, and when the running and lugging and hammering was over, the ladies were invited to behold the institution. It certainly was a pleasant place, airy, clean, and bright. A hop vine shook its green bells round the open window, the pretty aquarium stood in the middle of the room, with some delicate water plants rising above the water, and goldfish showing their brightness as they floated to and fro below. On either side of the windows were rows of shelves, ready to receive the curiosities yet to be found. Dan's tall cabinet stood before the great door which was fastened up, while the small door was to be used. On the cabinet stood a queer Indian idol, very ugly, but very interesting. Old Mr. Lawrence sent it, as well as a fine Chinese junk in full sail, which had a conspicuous place on the long table in the middle of the room. Above, swinging in a loop and looking as if she was alive, hung Polly, who died at an advanced age, had been carefully stuffed, and was now presented by Mrs. Joe. The walls were decorated with all sorts of things a snake's skin a big wasp's nest a birch bark canoe a string of birds eggs wreaths of gray moss from the south and a bunch of cotton pods the dead bats had a place also a large turtle shell and an ostrich egg proudly presented by demi who volunteered to explain these rare curiosities to guests whenever they liked there were so many stones that it was impossible to accept them all so only a few of the best were arranged among the shells on the shelves the rest were piled up in corners, to be examined by Dan at his leisure. Every one was eager to give something, even Silas, who sent home for a stuffed wildcat killed in his youth. It was rather moth-eaten and shabby, but on a high bracket and best side foremost the effect was fine, for the yellow glass eyes glared and the mouth snarled so naturally that Teddy shook in his little shoes at sight of it, when he came bringing his most cherished treasure, one cocoon, to lay upon the shrine of science. "'Isn't it beautiful? I'd no idea we had so many curious things. I gave that. Don't it look well? We might make a lot by charging something for letting folks see it.' Jack added that last suggestion to the general chatter that went on as the family viewed the room. "'This is a free museum, and if there is any speculating on it, I'll paint out the name over the door,' said Mr. Lorry, turning so quickly that Jack wished he had held his tongue. "'Hear, hear!' cried Mr. Bear. "'Speech! Speech!' added Mrs. Joe can't i'm too bashful you give them a lecture yourself you are used to it mr lorry answered retreating towards the window meaning to escape but she held him fast and said laughing as she looked at the dozen pairs of dirty hands about her if i did lecture it would be on the chemical and cleansing properties of soap come now as the founder of the institution you really ought to give us a few moral remarks and we will applaud tremendously 
seeing that there was no way of escaping mr lorry looked up at polly hanging overhead seemed to find inspiration in the brilliant old bird and sitting down upon the table said in his pleasant way there is one thing i'd like to suggest boys and that is i want you to get some good as well as much pleasure out of this just putting curious or pretty things here won't do it so suppose you read up about them so that when anybody asks questions you can answer them and understand the matter i used to like these things myself and should enjoy hearing about them now for i've forgotten all i once knew it wasn't much was it joe here's dan now full of stories about birds and bugs and so on let him take care of the museum and once a week the rest of you take turns to read a composition or tell about some animal mineral or vegetable we should all like that and i think it would put considerable useful knowledge into our heads what do you say professor i like it much and will give the lads all the help i can but they will need books to read up these new subjects and we have not many i fear began mr bear looking much pleased planning many fine lectures on geology which he liked we should have a library for the special purpose is that a useful sort of book dan asked mr lorry pointing to the volume that lay open by the cabinet oh yes it tells all i want to know about insects i had it here to see how to fix the butterflies right i covered it so it is not hurt and dan caught it up fearing the lender might think him careless give it here a minute and pulling out his pencil mr lorry wrote dan's name in it saying as he set the book up on one of the corner shelves where nothing stood but a stuffed bird without a tail there that is the beginning of the museum library i'll hunt up some more books and demi shall keep them in order where are those jolly little books we used to read joe insect architecture or some such name all about ants having battles and bees having queens and crickets eating holes in our clothes and stealing milk and larks of that sort in the garret at home i will have them sent out and we will plunge into natural history with a will said mrs joe ready for anything won't it be hard to write about such things asked nat who hated compositions at first perhaps but you will soon like it if you think that hard how would you like to have this subject given to you as it was to a girl of thirteen a conversation between themistocles aristides and pericles on the proposed appropriation of funds of the confederacy of delos for the ornamentation of athens said mrs joe the boys groaned at the mere sound of the long names and the gentlemen laughed at the absurdity of the lesson did she write it asked demi in an awe-stricken tone yes but you can imagine what a piece of work she made of it though she was rather a bright child i'd like to have seen it said mr bear perhaps i can find it for you i went to school with her and mrs joe looked so wicked that every one knew who the little girl was hearing of this fearful subject for a composition quite reconciled the boys to the thought of writing about familiar things wednesday afternoon was appointed for the lectures as they preferred to call them for some chose to talk instead of write mr bear promised a portfolio in which the written productions should be kept and mrs bear said she would attend the course with great pleasure then the dirty-handed society went off to wash followed by the professor trying to calm the anxiety of rob who had been told by tommy that all water was full of invisible pollywogs i like your plan very much only don't be too generous teddy said mrs bear when they were left alone you know most of the boys have got to paddle their own canoes when they leave us and too much sitting in the lap of luxury will unfit them for it i'll be moderate but do let me amuse myself i get desperately tired of business sometimes and nothing freshens me up like a good frolic with your boys i like that dan very much joe he isn't demonstrative but he has the eye of a hawk and when you have tamed him a little he will do you credit i'm so glad you think so thank you very much for your kindness to him especially for this museum affair it will keep him happy while he is lame give me a chance to soften and smooth this poor rough lad and make him love us what did inspire you with such a beautiful helpful idea teddy asked mrs bear glancing back at the pleasant room as she turned to leave it lorry took both her hands in his and answered with a look that made her eyes fill with happy tears dear joe i have known what it is to be a motherless boy and i never can forget how much you and yours have done for me all these years end of chapter eleven recording by crow girl caracrow.blogspot.com